All right, it's time to catch up with a dear friend of ours from our days here uh, in Las Vegas. He was actually a neighbor for a few years. Of course, you all know him as Big John McCarthy, one of the OGs of the ref world, now doing some color commentating. What's up, Big John? How you doing? I'm doing good, George. How you doing, man? Surviving. No A little, little, bit, little bit different atmosphere there, huh? Yeah. You know, I'd rather be at Mandalay Bay. I'll shoot you straight. But... You know, Mountain's Edge, quiet little neighborhood, just kind of hanging out until the governor tells us it's okay to get back to the strip. Man, I'll tell you what, he's killing Vegas. I'm sorry. It's just, I, I you got to be safe. But man, as long as it's been shut down, I never thought I would see that. Tell me about it. It is a ghost town. If you go down the strip, I mean, it's, it's unlike ever before. Honestly, it's a little scary. And even when they do say, hey, come on back, I just don't know who's who's going. Uh, are they going right away? Is Memorial Day going to be full? Is is Independence Day going to be full? Are we talking 2021? It's all a big mystery. Yeah, I know, and it's it's a question when you're looking at something like a casino. Are they going to are they going to also, OK, instead of having seven, eight people at a table, you can have three people maybe. I don't know. I mean, it's, the whole thing's crazy. We need that vaccine, man. I think the vaccine is really what oh. will just change everything. You know, kids back in school, the economy coming back. Like you said, a full blackjack table. But but until then, yeah, you're right. Everyone's going to have a different degree, a different level of comfortability around others. Yeah, and it's, you know, man, the thing I have, I know I know combat sports are going to be coming back fairly shortly as far as doing them without crowds, but I don't think you're going to see a crowd at a fight. Definitely not through 2020. I mean, it's just going to be weird. John, how do you anticipate just you and your play-by-play -play guy, whether it's, you know, Goldie or Amaro or Josh Thompson at the, at the Daz, Jay Glazer, whoever, I mean, how do you guys think you're going to do it? Uh, at some point, do you just accept, no, no, the job requires us to be like this, or will you guys make adjustments as well? You know, it is it is the question. They've talked about, are they going to separate and put, instead of you sitting right next to the person that you've sat next to that whole time, are they going to separate you and put you at two different desks? You know, it's the whole question. You know, you look at like what Jay and Josh does, or if it's, you know, the UFC and it's Karen Bryant with Bisping or whatever. You know, those people are normally close together because you have one camera with, you know, a camera shot. They're going to do something, and it's all up in the air right now. I think right now, at this moment, they're going to do things differently, and they're going to start separating people. I think you're going to see uh, people being interviewed almost at a, you know, a distance. So there's going to be a separation between them and the interviewer themselves. So if it was in Bellator, Jen Brown, she's going to be at a distance. She's not going to be right next to somebody. Or if it's Megan Olivia or Laura Sanko from the UFC, I think that distance is going to be there for a while. Think about even once the fight's over, you usually jump into the cage and you'll have a chat with the fighter. And Sometimes they'll get their sweaty paws on you, you know, and and uh, obviously you want to get close to them. They're still wiping off blood. I mean, have you even ever thought, how can that be done? I, I, I watch the news and they got these long mics. You guys aren't going to do that. It's going to look a little corny, but... You just abandon that part, uh, or 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 do you think there's a fix yet? Have you heard anything from the production team? You know, it's it's the question. I have, they haven't even gotten into that, and the whole thing is, you know, do you give a mic to the uh, to the fighter, and the, they can have their own mic, and you can talk at a distance, or you know, I've never worried about ever getting anything. If you you know, if people ask questions, you know, do you ever get blood on you if you're refereeing? It's like, are you kidding? How many times don't you? That would that would be uh, the lesser of them. It's just, you know, it's part of just doing the job. And so I've never worried about anything with being next to a fighter or, you know, getting something on me. The worst part is trying to get it out of your clothes if you're doing commentating when the blood splatters because then it's it's kind of nice clothing, so it's got to be dry clean. But it's, it's a real question on how everything is going to be different. Have you not been consulted? I mean, you've, you've put together the book on how to rap. You've definitely assisted heavily in how to judge. So you've been a big part of what it takes to do an MMA show. I would have imagined that by now, whether it's just Bellator or ABC 
or particular commissions, they would have already hollered at Big John, and maybe Big John would already have some of these ideas. Or, or, or have you, or have you just said, "Hey, look, my job's to call fights now. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I left that behind." No, you know, it's, it's funny. I've been really busy in the on the backside doing training for people, uh, online training, Zoom. I wish I would have known about Zoom before. I would have invested. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of training of officials. We've been doing a lot of things to, you know, keep people up to speed and get them better. You know, we've been doing a whole lot of things with uh, the ABC and uh, committees and things like that. So it's been a... Uh, it's been busy. I've been real busy. I've been, you know, as busy as you can be, you know, out of your home basically and stuff. So uh, as far as how to run a production, no, no one's, no one's consulted me and they shouldn't. Okay. You talked about zoom. Actually, your name came up a few days ago, maybe about 10 days ago, we had Frank Trigg on the show and he was talking about uh, the zoom meetings that are, that California state athletic commission has started doing. And now I guess other commissions are joining in and, he says it can sometimes run 60 deep. Oh, that was man. such a great thing to hear to a lot of us media and fans that have been wondering about accountability for refs and judges when something goes down. Is it immediate? Is it in the back? Or can you guys let cooler heads, you know, chill a little bit and then come back on a Tuesday, 72 hours after an event, after everyone's had the chance to look at the video and then, uh, address it. How long has that been going on, or did the pandemic start to bring bring that along? No, you know, like you, you know, said, Zoom and Go ahead. yeah, that that was all put together. Uh, Andy Foster was the one that you know he talked to me about. Hey, you know, you know they have these different ways that we can get online. Do you think that we could get some people online? I said, yeah, let's try it. You know, and so we tried it, and we, the first one we had, I think, five people on the call, and it was just you know we we watched. Uh, actual rounds of fights to see, you know, if we could get it to where it would look, you know, clear for the person and just had this idea and then it worked out. So we said, well, let's try it with, you know, more people. And so he invited some people, I invited some people. So the second one probably had 15 to 16. And then after that, it exploded. It was from, from 16, it went to 50 from 50. It went to a hundred. It's crazy, you know, cause you can go on to zoom and you can, you know, start going in those uh, graphs where it's got all the people and you keep clicking pages and there's just more and more. So a lot of people I know, some people I've never seen before, but it's all good because the athletic commissions are at least getting their people involved where, Hey, they hear th the way something should be done either uh, for the judge as far as criteria. Cause that's really what we bring up a lot. And right, what's the criteria. So when you saw this in the fight, where does that fit? What should you be giving? Or if we're talking about refereeing, we're talking about the mechanics that someone should use. Are they doing the right thing? Are they in the right position? Are they calling that the way it should be called? So it's been really good. I've often felt that the mechanics of the referees are ahead of the, hmm, we'll say the, I guess, the mechanic of judging. But by that, I mean, I, I think judges still can interpret a fight way differently than than when refs are watching a fight and they're positioning or where they want to be or what fighter they're isolating on because of uh you know because of damage they've taken is, is it a goal to have the judges feeling the same weight for a takedown versus a jab or a leg kick for example or is that the beauty of i guess the individuality of the human being Somebody might come from a wrestling background. Somebody might come from a kickboxing background. They may just have, you know, different interpretations. And because there's three of them, we take the three scores and say, that's the call right there. You know, it, it is. And it, to say, is it perfect? Nothing's perfect, George. But I'm, I'm going to give you a here, – here's a, here's a thing so people will understand. You have the three judges. And, and obviously – they all come from different backgrounds. So you're trying to take that person saying, all right, this is the criteria. Their background sometimes will make them actually harder on the fighter in the area that they're strongest because they expect the fighter to do that as well as they believe they can do it or they believe it should be done. When sometimes what the fighter's doing is actually effective, it's just not being done technically the right way. And so the judge that's proficient in that type of uh, martial art doesn't give them credit when they should. 
you know, it can also be, you know, you know, completely the opposite of it. But when you look at the judges, the judges are put into three different positions around the cage. And you know, I'm going to, I've said it before, we don't do them any favors with where we put them, you know, especially in some shows, they get two of the worst seats around that cage that you could get. And, but we want them to get the, the actual fight perfect. So we don't do them a lot of favors. But the other thing to think about is, you know, sometimes the fight happens and it happens right in front of them. And so they get all the information that you could you could want. They hear things, they see things, all of it is there for them. But the next fight, it happens, all, you know, sometimes every round, you'll get a guy that can take someone down and he scoots them or picks them up and walks them over to his corner, which is completely away from the judge. And so the judge gets basically a very bad view of the entire fight. And that's why we, you know, when even on the scorecards, the scorecards are either going to be, you know, different colors. They'll be, you know, white, blue, and red. You know, that's telling the commission where that judge was sitting. Or they'll they'll score they'll put them as you know, judge one, judge two, judge three. They know where they're sitting. And so many times they can look and say, well, this guy's score is different, but look where he was viewing the fight compared to these two guys. That makes sense. Frankly, John, I I don't want it to be uh I mean, I, I want the refing for sure to be almost the same. I like you guys all having the same mechanics. The judges, the mystery of it all, I, I don't want it to be like left field and right field, but I've always enjoyed watching sports knowing there's there's a, a basketball referee that might be quick-tempered, and he'll tee you up. You know, the coaches already know. Or, or maybe there's some that, like, don't mind the rough play underneath, and they'll let those guys throw elbows when they're going for a rebound. Or there's some referees in football that might not call holding, you know, or interference. You know, others that will let you play. I, I, I don't know. I've always appreciated a little bit of that. And, and sometimes even instant replay is just, uh, I don't know. It, I've taken a while to get used to it in some sports because I figured, you know what, the human being tried to the best of his ability to call it. And then we're just sitting there like this, waiting for the instant replay, you know, to get it right. And then sometimes even they goof it up. It's like sometimes it just takes away from the whole, I guess, spontaneity of a sporting event. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there's, you know, there is that human element. And it, the human element has been part of sports, you know, for as long as there's been sports. The more technology that we bring into it, obviously, we take some of that out, you know, to a, a certain degree. But you got to be honest and say, what we expect is the judge to be competent and we expect the judge to, you know, give us a, uh, an outcome that is viable based upon the fight that we have. And, and there's many times people are going to not agree with the judge because they want the fighter in the blue corner to win. And, you know, the judge goes with the fighter in the red corner and they're not happy with it. But that doesn't mean that the judge is wrong. It means that they looked at that fight kind of with a slanted eye because they wanted someone to win where the judge doesn't care who wins. He cares about getting it right. So that, you know, as long as that's what's happening, I never have a problem with, you know, judges and what they're doing. And, and there's going to be sometimes disagreements on what the judges say, but that doesn't mean it's controversial. Right. We, we bring up that word way too often and it's just not true. There's many fights that, Hey, they're close fights. You know, really close. It's not controversial in who won. That's not. Right. You know, it it could have gone to either guy, depending upon where you were sitting and what you saw. Yeah, and for all you that might um, not know this, John used to be uh, in LAPD. John, here's an old school uh, analogy. I want some cops to be like um, Hodges in the movie Colors. And I want some cops to be like Danny. You remember Sean Penn and Robert Duvall? They had different techniques, different styles of doing police work. You know, one guy uh, cozied more and, and befriended a little bit of the, the gang members, but he figured down the end it might pay off. And the other guy was full of aggression, and he wanted to make an impact right then and there. So the real cool movie, I'm sure you saw, John, back in the day when you were a cop, because I, I think it was focused on your city, right? Oh, yeah. I had a couple of friends that were in it, so... Oh, there you go. All right. Let me turn it over to Goes. He's got some questions for you. Big John, all right. Here's what I wanted to ask you, and I'm glad George turned it over right now because this, these were the topics that I wanted to talk about with you. Um, you know, you've shared with us before how 
the majority of the people that take those classes to become a ref or a judge don't usually pass the first time through. The percentage is actually kind of low because it's so tough and it's such an important job. But throughout time, now people have uh, access to things like a fight pass. Um, they can, there's more people that have taken your course that you can lean on for advice. Have the percentages gone up a little bit? Like has the common person that's gone in to take this class, have they come in a little bit more prepared than maybe years past? You know, you get you will. I'll get some guys that they're well prepared as far as knowing the sport of MMA, or they've looked up the rules and they've kind of memorized the unified rules and what they are. But that doesn't mean that they're prepared to actually handle a fight. And that's usually where they start to, you know, unravel. Things go too fast for them, even though in the beginning we do it very slow. But it's it it's not slow for them and then you know this is what makes tom brady what he is in the nfl is he can slow the game down and that's what the top referees and the top guys can do is they can slow the fight down so they're they're making decisions that they don't have to think as fast it's not that they're thinking faster than everyone they're actually slowing it down so they can make the right decision and that's what becomes very difficult for people to do. You, you have to make decisions. They have to be fast, but you need to figure out the ways to be able to slow the fight down. You know, yeah, my, my uh, failure rate is at about 90 to 95%. But that's because, you know, not everyone is meant to do this. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean you're meant to do it. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, continue to work to get better so you can eventually get there. You can. But, you know, hey, I'd like to fly the space shuttle. And no one's going to let me do that either. And there's a reason why. It's because I would suck at it. All right? And that's just that's just the way it is, is not everyone is meant to do this. There's a certain type of person that will tend to do better than others. And people that, you know, get nervous easily, that's not a good sign. It's not something that's going to help you in a fight. So you've not only got to know the sport, you've got to know all the different techniques that the fighters are doing. You have to know all the rules then you have to be able to physically and practically put the fight out there and make the right steps and make the right decisions. There's a lot to it. It's a lot harder than people realize. You know, being able to do things online is, is pretty insane now, the things that you can get certified in doing and never actually having to step foot into whatever practice, you know, like jujitsu. You can get belts online from some people. So my yeah. question to you is, Will there ever be the day and age where somebody could actually get certified in becoming a ref or a judge and never actually be in front of your face or step foot on a mat or in a gym or anything like that? I mean, certified through me? No, it won't happen. Now, I, I have thought it out to where we've, we've looked into doing things online where I could get people to a certain point where I can get them past some of the things that, hey, you know, this is stuff that you should know. And, you know, this sh it shouldn't be that I have to have you come in and I have to go over this with you and, and explain it to you. You should know this. So if I could do that type of thing online and get those people past all this lower stuff, well, then if I brought them in to be, you know, in a classroom setting and, you know, now we're, we're face to face and I can... I can do things that will, you know, accelerate, you know, how much they're learning and what they're learning instead of holding things up because, oh, I have to teach this part too, because this is the basics. And so I've, I've thought about it, but there would never be a time that I would say after, you know, watching you online or, you know, putting a class out that was, you could buy online that I would put my name behind you. Nope, not going to do it because it's just not about money to me. I don't care about the money. I care about the sport and I care about putting the proper people out there. And when I say proper people, proper people is not only the people that can function and do those things correctly. It's also the people that are going to treat the sport with the respect that it deserves, treat their, you know, uh, fellow peers, you know, the way they're supposed to not think that, oh, they deserve something because, oh, they've done something for two years and I should be you know, doing what Herb Dean does. No, you shouldn't. OK, you're not there and you, you have no idea what you don't know. And so, you know, those are the people that I'm always looking for. So if, if people get to that point where, you know, they would want to do it online, I could do that for the basic stuff. But you would always end up I'd always ha end up having to be face to face with you somewhere. 
this is going to be a comment outside looking in the observations that the media talk about sometimes even the fans when we are talking about having fights with no fans some of the things that stick out to me in having seen fights with no fans in attendance are very limited you hear every shot okay and you can tell which ones are bad and which ones are, are decent strikes there's a difference uh, without the people yelling around you and all that, you hear just about everything. And there's no crowd to react to certain shots where when you're thinking, uh, if it's a Brazilian fighter and you're in Brazil and they threw something that absolutely did not land, but the fans go crazy, if you're a judge and you didn't really see that, you might think that that fight, that punch actually landed. Can you maybe share or talk, talk with us, or maybe we're completely wrong, but what would be kind of the differences as far as judging and maybe even refing goes what would be the effects of having no fans on that situation? I think, you know, in both, both the refereeing and the judging, there's, uh, it's the same as the fighters in that you'll get guys, you know, when I, when I talk about people, you know, a Herb Dean, a Mark Goddard that are working now, they don't care what the fans say. They don't care what, you know, how many people are there. They don't care if they're booing they're going to do their job the way they know it needs to be done because they've had that experience and they have that knowledge and they're, they're confident in who they are. It's the same as certain fighters are what we call gym fighters in the gym. They can beat or, you know, stay with anyone. You, you bring in the world champion in that weight class and, and all of a sudden this guy's putting a whooping on him and everyone's going, Oh my God, he's so good. But that's the guy that when you put him out under the lights and with the pressure of the crowd, it just tends to make him very tight and he doesn't function the same way and he can't compete the way that he can practice. Well, it's the same, you know, with some referees, some referees or some judges, they will get influenced by the crowd and it's never good, but it's just human nature and that, that can happen. So, you know, the one thing I think you're going to see with, the no crowds, I think the, I think the decision-making by the, the referees is actually going to be better overall. I think they're, they don't have the pressure of the crowd saying anything. They'll hear the corners and stuff, but they know where they'll be and what they should be doing. And the other thing, when it comes to the judging, I think the judges are going to be better off by far. Because just like you said, see when, you know, like I was talking with George, George is saying, you know, the referee gets to move. He's right. The referee gets to move inside of that cage and I get to determine what's the best angle for me to see what I need to see where the judge doesn't have that right. He gets to sit in one spot and be there. And it's tough because, you know, he wants to change that angle and he can't. But the referee being close, hears a lot of things that the, the cameras don't pick up. The sound doesn't pick up. The judges don't hear but the referee hears it and that's all good information. And now the judges are going to be hearing a lot of those same blows. They're going to be hearing a lot of that same audio that's coming through because there's no crowd and that's going to be information. That's going to be knowledge. that's going to help them in making the right decision on that scorecard. All of you referees are badasses, you know, uh, whether you've stepped in the cage or not, in my opinion, uh, you know, if there's a fire, you guys will go into the fire. I do want to ask you a question. This virus is invisible and it's deadly. Uh, have any of these referees that might be on these upcoming cards just asked you point blank, Big John, should I go? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they have. And, and, and what are you sensing? Um, were you able to put them at ease? Would you go, John, if you were still a referee? Like, or, or do you want to see this unfold a little bit more as we keep getting more info from WHO and CDC and all the other experts out there? Well, you know, there's there's two sides to it, George. And that's, you, you look and I know it sounds weird, but uh, the two sides are this. When you have a situation like the UFC was having with, the previous 249, not this one. We have UFC 249 where they were trying to put it on on tribal land in California, and everything that they were doing was going against what they had always done. They were running from regulation because the California State Athletic Commission could not do it, said they would not do it, and you had some of the very best officials sitting in California, guys, you know, 
like Herb Dean, Jason Herzog, Mike Beltran, Frank Trigg, Mike Bell, Ron McCarthy, all these guys that go everywhere. We're not going to do that show because, hey, we can't do that. It's not a regulated show and it's in our state. But you had some guys that were going to do it. Now, they made a decision. It was a bad decision because there comes that point where you got to say, I can't do that because it's wrong. It's wrong for the sport. You know, the promotion wants to do it. That's great. But I've got to be the guy that does things that's by the book because I'm that regulator. I'm with your, I'm with regulation. So now the UFC is going to do this show in Florida, in Jacksonville, and the Florida State Athletic Commission is allowed to do it. So anybody that is going to do that show, I would tell them, go do it. You know, I would say, hey, yes, you have an opportunity to go do it, go do it because they're working for the Florida State Athletic Commission. The UFC as a promotion, look, they're a great promotion. I would never sit there and say that they're not. And I know the people that they use as medical advisors. Jeff Davidson is their chief guy that they go to. And he's he's a guy I worked with as a ringside physi physician for years in Nevada. And he's fantastic. He's a great guy. And I know that he's putting together a plan. And I know that he's... You know, going to be working with a guy named Don Muzi, who is a physician in Florida, who is also the president of the uh, the Ringside Physicians Association. So, you know, they're doing everything they can to make this as functionally safe as possible. Does that mean that they can cover every little gnat's ass there is? No, that's impossible unless they put people into quarantines for weeks before and then weeks after. And it's just it's a position where you can only go so far, but I believe that they're going to be doing the right thing for all the officials. I believe they're going to do all the right things for the fighters. And there comes a point where you've got to start to try to move forward. And I think that after waiting what they've waited, I think this is a good time. And the, the athletic commission in Florida is, is able and willing to do it. So I think anybody that asked me about doing this show, I would tell them, go do it. Prior show, I told them, don't do it. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm 99% sure of the answer here, but I just got to ask because I'd rather know for sure 100%. The referee will not be wearing a mask, correct? They have to be audible to the fighters. Yeah. you. I don't think the referees should be wearing a mask. You know, all of those, all of them are going to be tested. Okay. The fighters are going to be tested. The referees are going to be tested. The people there are going to be tested. Now that doesn't mean, you know, that something couldn't slip by and someone might have something but you know pe people are going into uh you know grocery stores and gas stations and doing things and is what is the mask for the mask they say is more for the other people well i can't tell you that i've ever sneezed a lot or coughed a lot while refereeing your, your brain is when it's going doesn't tend to do those things and the fighters don't do those things so i, I don't think that's a problem will bellator and by Bellator, I guess I mean more you. I don't know if you can speak on behalf of Bellator. I mean, is the yellow pad going to be out? Are you guys going to be taking notes? Are you guys kind of observing you guys, much like Juan and everyone else, to see what's going to happen with the UFC? Or do you guys base your own decisions on whatever committee you guys put together on when to go forward? No, that's an easy answer. You know, Bellator makes its own decisions. You know, And, and you could see that by... You know, we we had a show that was March 13th at the Mohegan Sun and Scott Coker pulled the plug on that after, you know, taking and, and saying, OK, well, I don't think we're going to do it with the crowd and, and taking the crowd out of it and then taking and canceling the show completely while the UFC in Brazil went and did their show. So there's, you know, Scott Coker is he's his own man and he makes his own decisions and the, the decisions of, you know, Bellator that's the guy that makes them now will he be interested in you know hey yeah he's going to be interested in please don't make a mistake he's looking at the ufc and saying don't make a mistake don't let someone get you know the coronavirus and get infected you do that you're going to be holding everybody up and you know it's a it is a possibility so uh that's something that could happen but everything that bellator does that goes through the bellator management and the people that run it and that's at the top is scott coker he's the man making the decisions john i want to
thank you so much for jumping on with us and answering some of these questions and kind of giving us a an outlook of maybe what's what's to come. You've seen so much in the sport and had a hand so much in building the sport, uh, and it's great that you know you allow us to catch up with you from time to time and find out more. I mean, this pandemic thing is so wild. Um, I don't know what's going to happen on May 9th. I don't even know how I'm going to feel on May 9th. In fact, I've been saying, I don't know what the winners, I know the losers of the fight aren't going to like it. I don't even know what the winner of the fight is going to think because I remember watching Hinato Moicano win in Brasilia and it was in, so it was in front of his home country, but yet he still felt empty because he said, the, the, you know, my, my fans were supposed to be here, my friends and family, and they, he always had like this little mini meltdown, you know what I mean? So I'm wondering how all this is going to be and, and how, how the sport's going to be going forward. But, um, geez, uh, I, I, I still can't believe we're talking under these terms instead of previewing a, a nice big fat Bellator card, a featherweight Grand Prix, a million-dollar check that still needs to be written out, you know what I mean? Hello. Absolutely, man. <laughs> I can't wait for that to get back because I'm looking for – uh, the one thing at least that I can I believe that I can say to the fans out there, you know, the, the last half of your 2020 when it comes to fights, I think you're going to see some just incredible fights from everybody that is going to be putting on these shows. Bellator has got some matchups that are going to be incredible. The UFC has got matchups. You know, the this, this show that they're going to put on, it's a hell of a card. So at least yeah we've been suffering without but i think we're going to be getting an incredible amount of quality for the second half of the year here just with no fans thanks again john we appreciate it hope to catch up with you soon good talking to you george goes you take care too